Social reproduction refers to the processes that ensure the self-perpetuation of a social structure over time, in rough analogy to biological reproduction for a population. That is the definition taken from encyclopedia.com. Social reproduction as a concept was first mentioned by Karl Marx in Capital Volume 1, but it was largely focused on the way that capitalism necessitated the reproduction of labour in a form that suited its requirements. To put it more plainly, capitalism needed a continual supply of fresh workers that knew their place and how to behave in a workplace. Marxist feminism developed this definition into talking about reproductive labour and discussing, as Wikipedia puts it, the role of women in wider social and class structures and their often unrecognised contribution to the capitalist economy by their traditional role within the household as both childbearers and family caretakers, and by extension, women's role as providers of free labour that is necessary to produce and maintain current and future workers. Sociologists such as Pierre Bourdieu went further with the concept, taking it beyond its direct relation to capital, and breaking it down into the subcategories of economic, cultural, social and symbolic capital. These categories were an attempt to describe the many layers to the way society seeks to pass information through the generations, to ensure the preservation of hierarchy, power dynamics and ultimately inequality. Taken from infed.org, children enter the school system with different amounts of capital. They do not start and continue within the system with the same resources and advantages. The result is, as Bourdieu argues, that the system then largely reproduces advantage. Those with the luck of being born into families with money and the right cultural capital progress further than those who are not. They do not have an inherent ability and advance on merit, but start out with and are supported by those possessing the right mix of economic and cultural capital. So for our purposes in this video, social reproduction is about how society maintains its values and creates those that will keep that society going into the next generation. What we teach our children, who teaches them, and who chooses what they should be taught are vital questions in the formation of a society that can continue to replicate itself. Let's explore why that is and why this is a concept that we on the left should be aware of. Social reproduction, in any of the forms covered in the de definition section, is important to consider because of the long-term implications to society. Not that kind of implication, though. A society requires children to be raised to understand what is expected of them. Given the importance of this role for the continuance of a society, we must then ask the question of who is responsible for this task. In their manifesto, Feminism for the 99%, Cynthia Aruza, Tithi Bhattacharya and Nancy Fraser say the following. In capitalist society, the organisation of social reproduction rests on gender. It relies on gender roles and entrenches gender oppression. Social reproduction is therefore a feminist issue. They develop this further to say, Historically, capitalist societies have sought to enlist women's social reproductive work in the service of gender binarism and heteronormativity. They encouraged mothers, teachers and doctors, among others, to ensure that children are strictly fashioned as cis girls or cis boys and as heterosexuals. Finally, Working class mothers and schools have been expected to prepare their kids for lives as proper workers, obedient, deferential to bosses and primed to accept their station and tolerate exploitation. As is made clear in this selection of excerpts, social reproduction is largely considered a gendered role, and as such it generally falls to women to oversee this critical task, as per this Vogel quote taken from Tithi Bhattacharya's 2013 article on socialistworker.org. Ordinarily, Generational replacement provides most of the new workers needed to replenish this class, and women's capacity to bear children therefore plays a critical role in class society. In property classes, women's oppression flows from their role in the maintenance and inheritance of property. In subordinate classes, female oppression derives from women's involvement in processes that renew direct producers as well as their involvement in production. The oppression of women, then, remains tied into our understandings of social reproduction, given that such a vital task is not only gendered, but also considered unworthy of pay in the main. We will develop this further in the next section, but before we do, let's have a quick look at how institutions play their part in this oppression and this cycle of social reproduction, using a quote from the Stanford Centre on Poverty and Inequalities article on Pierre Bourdieu's Power and Ideology in Education. According to Bourdieu, Cultural reproduction is the social process through which culture is reproduced across generations, especially through the socialising influence of major institutions. 
Bourdieu applied the concept in particular to the ways in which social institutions such as schools are used to pass along cultural ideas that underlie and support the privileged position of the dominant or upper class. Cultural reproduction is part of a larger process of social reproduction, through which entire societies and their cultural, structural and ecological characteristics are reproduced through a process that invariably involves a certain amount of social change. From a Marxist perspective, social reproduction is primarily economic in scope. In a broader sense, however, social reproduction is much more than this, from the shape of religious institutions to language and varieties of music and other cultural products. Not only, then, is oppression baked into our methods of social reproduction, but also into the reproduction itself, with preservation of the existing hierarchies and its power dynamics at the forefront. There are several key battlegrounds on the left that are tied into these ideas of social reproduction. The exploitation of unpaid labour, that being the work of home, of care, of maintenance, and vitally here, of course, social reproduction, underpins how capitalism maintains its drive for maximal profit. Going back to feminism for the 99%, we find the following on the subjugation of what is mostly women, though not exclusively. Capitalism established new, distinctively modern forms of sexism. Its key move was to separate the making of people from the making of profit. To assign the first job to women and to subordinate it to the second. Because capital avoids paying for this work to the extent that it can, while treating money as the be-all and end-all, it relegates those who perform social reproductive labour to a position of subordination. From a specifically Marxist feminist perspective, we return to Titi Bhattacharya's 2013 article again that articulates the way that capitalism attacks us using social reproduction as a weapon. A woman worker also sleeps in her home. Her children play in the public park and go to the local school, and sometimes she asks her retired mother to help out with the cooking. In other words, the major functions of reproducing the working class take place outside the workplace. Who understands this process best? Capitalism. This is why capitalism attacks social reproduction viciously in order to win the battle at the point of production. This is why it attacks public services, pushes the burden of care onto individual families, cuts social care in order to make the entire working class vulnerable and less able to resist its attacks on the workplace. We exist in a situation where social reproduction, that being the raising of children to be good citizens, is both a vital task for the continuation of civilization and a completely gendered and devalued labour that often isn't even counted as such. The battle to have this kind of unpaid labour recognised for the work it is, and to ensure that those providing it are both valued and represented in discussions for our future, is ongoing even on the left. When we hear talk about the working class, when we hear the Labour Party churning out more guff about working families, and when we hear trade unions talking about workers receiving fair pay, it is normally safe to assume that those providing the unpaid and unrecognised labour underpinning all of these discussions are being omitted. Whilst there is far more to unpaid labour than just social reproduction, and there's bigger conversations to be had about how we recognise and represent the interests of those providing said unpaid labour, social reproduction remains a huge subject in its own right. What we teach our kids at home and at school helps to shape the society that will come after us. We have seen many attempts in the last decade to change how education is presented and in what ideas it is allowed to present. And this is a clear indication that the Tories in particular understand the importance of controlling the prevailing narrative in social reproduction. From the Telegraph, Education watchdog criticised for promoting anti-British charity to universities. The Office for Students has come under fire for referring institutions to advance HE, which has been accused of egregious wokery. Yeah. From the Huffington Post, we have... Gove's proposed history curriculum forgets that we live in 2013, not the 1950s. Gove inexcusably glosses over some of the worst horrors of British colonial history, yet his first stated aim is to show how Britain influenced the world. Mau Mau and British-run forced labour camps in South Africa, for example, seem forgotten. Controlling social reproduction is a vital tool for social control more generally, as it allows you to manipulate the societal narrative and the cultural stories we choose to remember Poppies, The Empire, Jubilee, Churchill Good, and the ones we choose to forget. Churchill Bad, Colonialism, Rejecting Jewish Refugees During the Second World War, 
and the royal family. And all. Understanding this and the way that it is rarely spoken about in the media makes it all the more important for us on the left to think about, to discuss and to educate on. To close out, here is one last quotation from Feminism for the 99%. As neoliberalism demands more hours of waged work per household and less state support for social welfare, it squeezes families, communities and above all, women to breaking point. Under these conditions of universal expropriation, struggles over social reproduction have taken centre stage. They now form the leading edge of projects with the potential to alter society, root and branch. Thank you for joining me for another short video. I hope you found this useful. Give the video a like and subscribe for more content if you liked it and hopefully I'll see you again real soon. Take care of each other, join a union and solidarity to all those whose labour continues to be undervalued and unpaid.